And everybody acknowledge our recording before I go any farther. Speak now or forever, hold your peace. Yep. Well, I, sometimes that we had problems with this on another call where someone couldn't unmute because they hadn't acknowledged that yet. So find that button and click the OK. Um, so we're going to talk about why that can happen. So rarely in the in the Amarillo world, for the, especially with HTs and repeaters and such, do you have a balanced path? Uh, most repeaters are higher power uh, with antenna gain and really good feed line and such. Uh, but if you, this example right here uh, talks about, you know, your downlink is stronger than your uplink. When you when you use a repeater, your your signal is retransmitted. Actually, Brian. So when you're going through your slides, we see the one that has radio pass power budgets and then a preview on the left side. So if you've got dual displays, you may be showing the wrong one. Uh, I do have dual displays, but I'm on the PowerPoint display. So we see and one that, big slide and then the film strip on the left side. Oh no, that's the. That's not the film strip. That's the participants window. Kind of, does that get rid of it? No. Didn't change. It hasn't hasn't changed at all. Now it disappeared. Yeah, I just turned it off. Turned it back on again. Is that one better. Let's see. Yep. Hey, there we go. That one. That one we can read. It created. It created a new window that I wasn't sharing when I went into presentation mode, word for the wise. So let me get focused on that window. All right, there's the balance of power budget thing. Uplink, downlink, does that look better? Much. Okay. So when using a repeater, and again, we are doing this for the golden packet, but it's it's for knowledge base. So the stuff I'm talking about later makes more sense. Yeah, you know, in a repeater, your signal is received and retransmitted to the high power from typically a mountaintop or tower site. All your signal has to do is get there, and then the repeater does all the work. But uh, just because you can hear a repeater well does not mean your signal in to the repeater is good. Uh, So this is typically where we get an imbalanced path. The repeater transmit a high power of 35 to 75, 100 watts or more. And uh, it has a high gain antenna and it takes your little measly uh, HT that you're holding sideways and inside your car. And people are telling you, you don't have a good signal and you can hear the repeater great. You keep talking and don't know why. And people get annoyed with you because you sound like static and drives everybody else on the repeater crazy. but you can't hear it because you're not hearing your own signal. Uh, so your HT on two meters is five watts before you calculate losses from a rubber duck antenna. Uh, half the power gets out of that antenna or the rubber dummy load, so we like to call it. And so, you know, you're transmitting anywhere from half a watt to, you know, less, uh, depending on how you're operating your your HT. Your antenna gain, this is uh, a big part of power budgets. You're, you're, they're rated in decibels or dB. And for frequencies below one gigahertz, your antennas are expressed in dB gain of dBD, which is dB over a dipole antenna. When you get above one gigahertz, you'll see a, a, an abbreviation called DBI, which is dB over an uh, isotropic radiator or a, a theoretically perfect antenna that, don't, that doesn't exist. And that's a difference of about 2.1 dB. A dBD antenna is going to be 2.1 dB lower than an isotropic. When you're looking at antennas and buying them and buying them based on dB, you gotta pay attention to the advertising because if they're expressing it and uh, hey, this one's got two more dB and they're, they're just saying dBi instead of dBD, it's the same as the other antenna that is expressed in DVD. So the decibel, one thing to understand is the decibel is a logarithmic 
measurement system. So when you get 3 dB gain in something, it takes your power and it doubles it. And then if you had 6 dB, it takes what was doubled and doubles it again. So if you have an antenna, say you've got 5 dB or 5 watts out of an HT and you've got a 6 dB gain antenna. The, the first 3 dB doubles your 5 watts to 10 watts. Then this, you've got another 3 dB that doubles that 10 watts again. So you're getting 20 watts effective radiated power. Ten dB is a ten times increase. So if you had a system gain of ten dB and you're putting five watts into it, you're getting fifty watts effective radiated power. Twenty dB is a hundred times increase in power. So you would have a hundred watts out of an HD if you had a twenty dB antenna and no line loss. HTs at two meters have anywhere from ten to twenty dB loss meaning negative gain. If it goes up with 10 dB gain, it also goes down by, 100, by 10 times if you've got negative gain. Another important factor, that's not just about your power output. It's also your receive signal that comes back. If you've got 10 dB on your receive signal, what's at coming at the antenna is, is multiplied so that you get that 10 dB gain to your receiver. Uh, and this is why you have antenna mount uh, preamps, because you want to amplify that signal to hit your antenna, not amplify the signal in your shack after it had all the loss of your feed line. So all you're doing is amplifying noise. HTs and gain or lack of. This is a cute little chart. Um, it comes from the old GE two-way radio business that no longer exists by GE anyways, uh, but it's, it's a great reference chart. So if you've got a handheld with an antenna held vertically on two meters, they figure 60 dB loss. If you take your, play Joe Cool with your HT and tip your antenna back, now you've got 10 dB loss. And if you leave it on your hip and use a wonderful speaker mic, you've got 17, sometimes 20 dB loss because the antenna is lower, it's on your hip, you don't know where the repeater is, your body could be blocking signal. I hate HTs and I really hate uh, speaker mics. It's, these numbers are, are the reason why. Um, so other measured losses, you know, if you've got a radio on your hip in your car or, or just standing outside at two meters, you're 20 dB, 25 dB loss. Your radio laying on a seat with a speaker up in the front, negative 36 dB, remembering that 20 dB is 100 times reduction in power. Then you've got 20 dB plus 10 plus six, you're getting a lot of losses leaving that radio lane on the seat. And yet you can still hear the repeater fine, so your signal should be good. And of course, the radio is connected to a mag mount antenna with say 15 feet or less of coax, you've only got two dB loss. This is a concept, pluses and minuses in dB. You know, three. You think three dB is no big deal when you're talking 36 total. Again, three dB half, six dB half and half. So uh, it's important to understand these. And then they go into losses about a building. While antennas can give you gain, feed line or coax and connectors all can give you losses. Uh, and it, this is why you look up the loss per foot of, or per 100 feet of coax. This is why cheap Chinese adapters don't always perform as good silver coated or anything like that, or well manufactured to tight tolerances. This is why you hear a lot of people on the UHF band say, use an end connector, don't use a PL259 or an SO239. Because they are, I've seen some connectors, barrel connectors and stuff on UHF get 3 dB loss just through a connector. Remember that one, that one connector can cut you in half. And then when you're doing a BNC to PL-259 and then a PL-259 to a barrel connector, then to the coax connection on your cable, that stuff adds up. 
this is a chart of coax, various coaxes and the loss at frequencies uh, per 100 feet. The, uh, one of the things I don't show you on this chart is uh, as you get to certain frequencies, you can have a maximum radius bend of the coax. And if you exceed that, you start squishing the coax and the dielectric inside so that it changes the distance between your center conductor and the outer conductor, which changes your impedance, which creates additional loss. And the higher in frequency you go, the more, much more sensitive you are to that. Antenna polarization. Do you know that off, when you're on, not on the HF bands, if you're horizontal and somebody else is vertical, there's 20 dB of signal loss just for that fact, 20 dB. That's 100 times loss in signal. So make sure you have the same polarization. Loss or blockages due to buildings and materials, you know, that's harder to predict for. But on two meters and 440s, it nowhere near doing stuff like in the microwave and the millimeter wave, which is a lot of the stuff that I work with. Do you know that at five gigahertz, it only takes 60 feet of distance in an RF path to totally kill the five gig signal. 60 feet of tree canopy. I'm sorry, I didn't finish that statement. That's that's a lot of loss at five gigahertz. When you're talking 34, 32, even 24 gigahertz, if you're using those bands, a simple leaf can block the signal. So uh, we had a kind of, on the mailing list that we had a conversation about that a couple of weeks ago. Losses for trees and stuff are not as significant for this drill. So here's the proper way to hold and transmit an HC, right? This is, I love. There's at least 20 dB loss because she's doing that. And mouth's not close enough. She's probably turning her head talking to somebody else at the same time. Uh, so that's my slide deck. Now, let me fire up. First of all, is there any questions on that before I go any further? I think Lynn had a question at one point. You're on, you're on mute, Lynn. I did. Um, is it true that almost all gain antennas are actually directionally gained? So an isotropic radi radiator in a, in a vacuum uh, radiates 360 degrees in a sphere. To get gain on an omni antenna, what they do is they take the top and squish it like a donut. So you can have an omni antenna have gain, but there's only so much gain you can get from an omni. You're squishing that signal. So instead of being the perfect ball, you've got the donut. And in things like uh, terrestrial based communications, that's okay because you typically don't need to send radiation and signal into the sky because it's not HF, you're not using the uh, ionosphere to bounce the signal off. The exception of that is satellites, but satellites are typically using uh, a gain antenna and aiming it in the sky. So yes, now when you get past the theoretical gain, six, maybe eight, nine dB, it's probably some of the maximum gain you can get from an Omni. Then to get more gain, you have to start making the antenna directional on the horizontal plane. So it could be a beam corner reflector, or you could have a, a cartoid pattern to where it's not a circle. If you're looking down from the top of the antenna, it's not a perfect circle. It starts to go to a figure eight pattern and you get you know, bi-directional uh, Yagis, panel antennas. You haven't changed the power, you just redirected it in one particular direction and that's the gain that you're getting. Right, okay. So the five watts becoming 20 watts through a six dB antenna is really just because they're squashing those five watts and putting them out in a and given place. It out the horizon instead of everywhere. But got it. Thank, thank you. But you're probably not going to get a 20 dB omni gain antenna, but you could get one from a beam quite easily. If you look at most uh, omni antennas, you know they're probably going to be rated. You know they go three, six fractions of that up to maybe nine. When it starts getting into nine, you start getting into the, the figure eight patterns and stuff. Um, that's why when you look at an antenna chart, they give you two, two charts. One is what they call the horizontal. It's if you're hovered in the sky above it and there's the, the, the pattern and then the elevation view, that's if you were standing at the side of the earth, you know, a cross-sectional view 
you're looking at how high the angles go up or down towards the horizon. And uh, with an antenna, typically they're rated with directional gain, where if you looked at that top down view of a horizontal pattern, uh, if it was a directional antenna, the beam width of that is where either side of the center line of the antenna, it'll be so many degrees. If it's a 60 degree antenna, 30 degrees either side of that, uh, what they call the bore site or the azimuth the antenna is aimed before it drops more than TB, 3 dB in gain on the antenna pattern. I can show you that in radio mobile here in a minute. Any other questions before I jump to? Uh, John and I both have questions. John, go first. You had your hand up. Thank you, Tim. You mentioned there was a 20 dB loss for cross path vertical versus horizontal. Correct. And, and I was kind of uh, curious because I thought the loss was less than that. So I was kind of curious where that number came from. That's uh, stated in many, many antenna theory books and stuff like that, if you look at that. But it, it, you will lose 20 dB. Now, it may 20 dB may not be enough that you'll notice it, but cross pullers going, if you're one end at 20 or ver vertical, the other end is at horizontal, it's a 20 dB measured loss. Um, now, depending on what bands, like when you get to in the HF bands and stuff, and it's a longer path, you get what they call twist, where as the signal goes farther, it'll start to twist. And that's why it's not as apparent in HF, especially after it goes up and scatters off the ionosphere, because it's twisted so that you can't really discern whether it's vertical or horizontal. But for terrestrial base land bubble radio, which two meters and four forty is clearly uh, falls within that, you'll get that 20 dB difference. So that's a good question because that, there is a clarification of that. Yeah. Now I got a question. Um, are you finished, John? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, what is an effective tool to measure this loss? Is it modeling or is there some other tool we could use? Well, there's a, there's a bunch of ways. First of all, there's, you know, a good old power meter, uh, you know, a bird or anything that measures power you can hook as close to the transmitter as you can then go to the other end and measure your power up then go to the other end at the end of your feed line hook it up there measure the power again you can tell how many watts you're losing or anything sure okay uh, now you can use vnas vnas being fifty dollars fifty to one hundred dollars now they're great tools to measure loss and impedance and affected uh with connectors and you can actually sweep the length and you can measure how much distance and, and you've got a bad spot in coax. There's other expensive 50, 60, 70, hundred thousand dollar equipment that you can get in the commercial two-way world that you can measure that stuff as well. But with the fact that you can buy VNAs now, it's tiny VNAs for 50 to hundred bucks. Every ham should get that. You've also got uh, the MFJ antenna, antenna analyzers. Uh, they'll, some of them will actually measure the line loss. And sometimes that's, uh, you know, if you can get it in dB, it's easy to start doing in the math. And there's online calculators where you can put in the power and your dB gain or loss or whatever, and it'll figure that out for you. But, uh, and of course, an SWR meter is an indicator that you've got some issues as well. You don't get as much granularity and you don't know all the details, but. ISWR means standing wave ratio, which means you've got signal reflecting back that's not going out the antenna. So, and antenna tuners just turn it to heat. They don't make it any more fun. Right. Don, you look like you've got stuff you're thinking about. I can see your face. You're muted, Don. Your mute's on, Don. Just trying to understand what you're saying and doing some testing with it. Keep going. Okay. Well, believe me, if you've got questions, now's the time to ask because uh, there, there's a lot of ability to be able to make things work better. Um, and uh, you just look like you've had some experience with this stuff and can, can chime in. You're nodding. So I thought that. Uh, I'm a total novice. I'm at your mercy. Keep going. Really? Okay. Well, if I, and if I go too fast on any of this, because I've been doing this so much and 
I do it professionally every day. Um, I can sometimes gloss over things. So please, the questions, if, if something I say doesn't quite register, please stop me and ask. So we've talked about power and gain and all that stuff. Now let's go to well, path studies and radio mobile. Jeff, this is where I'm using radio mobile, but I'm not gonna teach them how to make coverage plots. So let me know, can you see this screen? It's basically the East Coast, it's just raw terrain data and all the sites along the, the system, right? Yep. All right, so we're gonna look at path studies. So, oops, why is, no, I don't want that. I gotta click, I'm not going that far. All right, what you're looking at here is Springer to Klingwins Mountain. What are you looking at in this little window here? Well, you've got the two transmitters. You've got these little ovals. That's what they call the Fresnel zone. Fresnel zone, and it's not Fresnel, it's Fresnel. That's French. And it took me a lot of years to break that habit. <laughs> you want to have a, at least six tenths of a Fresnel zone clear to have a good path. But there's a lot this tells me right here. First of all, the distance between these two points, 138.35 kilometers. We're making some long paths here, right? I can, I can go to the details and I've got some text here. It's 86 miles. It's a big hop. The Springer is, is that Stone Mountain or is that the actual first site? Springer is technically it's Mount Oglethorpe, but it's close to Springer Mountain. Yeah, I'm all, I've got that name on here too, but. Is and that, it is the southernmost point that we're using. Okay. So I've got text here. The interesting thing is I've got the, the true azimuth and the magnetic azimuth. In some places of the country, you need to know that there is a difference. Here in New York State, it's about 13 degrees difference. 13 degrees to the west is where the, from true north, is where a compass, magnetic compass needle is going to point. So you, it's good to know when someone says, aim your antenna at this azimuth, if you're trying to make a, a connection between two places, you need to ask them, is that true or magnetic? And if they can't tell you the difference, you need to know what the difference is. Uh, knowing your declin, they, the difference between true and magnetic is what they call the declination. And if you ever have a seven and a half minute quad map and you ever look down the lower right corner, there's gonna be a compass and north arrow and stuff. And they'll show both the magnetic and the, the true north and a little arc to, to show what the difference. Out in Spokane, Washington, it's 20 degrees difference. So uh, this can make a difference when you're on the hill trying to aim a, a directional antenna towards one of your neighboring points. So back to the profile view. So this blue or this uh, brown here is the, it's like if we slice the earth, that's the cross-sectional profile of the, uh, the, the, the terrain on the earth. So I just changed something here. So the Springer one, that is, those are the coordinates that I was provided from Jeff where all these sites are, right? And I asked Lynn today, do you have a different list of where people were at, at different spots on the mountaintop? And there is a slight difference. Hang on just a second. Yeah, the difference Which is, is interesting because I, I got them from APRS.fi. Okay, well, yeah, that's, that's my list. Yeah. Uh, but I, that's one reason I stress to the operators, you know, I have these objects out there. Tell me if that object is where you actually are operating from. So those operators that are in the call here or watching the video later, check your GP hyphen object at APRS.fi. And if it's not, zoom in real tight, see if it is actually where you're setting up your station. If not, we need to get it moved so that we can benefit from what Brian's doing here. I'm redrawing the map because I added all your coordinates as a second set today and they didn't inherit the ground elevation. So I've got to do that right now. Actually, oops.
This was one thing I did not want to do and I had to do it anyways. So Jeff, can you pull up the, uh, the web page with the paths for right now while I'm waiting for this map to redraw? I sure can. On the web page, I made, based on the original list that Jeff gave me, paths, I made three paths going from the south site to the north site. You're talking about the wiki where I posted yeah, what you yeah. created? Yep. All those okay. screenshots. Yep. Hang on a second here. Okay. So this is the site you just saw the image. Um, so again, what you're looking at on the left is the site uh, Springer One, and the right side, uh, the right side is Klingman. So this one is at the proper elevations. You'll see there's a good path there, right? And you know that because these you see these first, second, and third Fresnel zones, those white lines, the footballs, so to speak, they're dirigible, wherever you want to go. There's no encroachment on that. And it's, uh, it's set right there on the two meter band. So what did we assume? So we assumed at a 45 watt radio, because we're doing this based on the Kenwoods, your line loss is 1.3 dB and your antenna, your antenna gain on the other side of the end, the other end is 3 dB, which is pretty typical for a 5 8 wave antenna. So that path would work with a 45 watt radio and a 5 8 wave two meter on it, right? When you scroll down, now we look at the UHF path. So this is a, uh, assuming 25 watts UHF you're a 3.5 dB gain antenna, which is pretty typical for a, a UHF uh, 5 8 wave. But look, right, uh, you're on the right side there. You see 5.7 dBi and 3.5 dB dBd. There's where your marketing will get you every time. <laughs> uh. That's the same value. dBi shows a higher gain because it's a theoretical gain. dBd is 2.5. Well, 2.2 dB less. Um, but it's also assuming because we're talking UHF, we're using RG58 on your card typically, maybe an adapter. So I'm adding 3 dB of loss in the UHF. But notice those footballs in that image are a lot smaller. The Fresnel zone is calculated based on frequency and distance. So when you go higher in frequency, the Fresnel zone gets smaller. Uh, and in this case, there's less encroachment for that mountain. It's about three quarters away, uh, a little down in the in the football, Jeff. No, I'm just wondering this worst for now up yeah, here. Yeah, worst for now is it's still six tenths of a for now. Right? Okay. Yeah. It, and and good good radio engineering practices when they do microwave pass, they actually try to uh, engineer for that six tenths, no more, no less, because. If there's odd and even numbers for null zones, first, second, third, fourth, right? When you get an even number for null zone exposed, it's actually 180 degrees out of phase and it'll drop your signal by 3 dB. Brian, why do you, as far as like the, just the uh, S meter here? I don't know that. It's, it's showing you what it should be on either end. It's, S meters are useless and they're just as useless in the software. No, I just wonder like why there is it. Okay, so that's that's effectively what, what it would expect. Well, you're going to look at your RX relative value there, right? Your negative 45.1 dB. Mm -hmm. It's up there in the green on top of the image. Lower right box. There it is. There's You're getting it, your signal at neg 45 on UHF. That's plenty. Uh, by the way, most radios are gonna be good down to neg 113. That's about a dot three microvolt sensitivity. Uh, but as Bob always said, and with these hardware TNCs, you're gonna need about three or six dB more than that. So negative 116, ideally negative 113 is the received signal strength that you're gonna need for these hardware TNCs to work. Let me say that again, because this is why we're doing the appliance experiment. Hardware TNCs need stronger signal than, you know, you can take a little fade by the human ear and still make everything out. Binary stuff in a hardware TNC, 
doesn't do that. You know, you miss a bit, you miss a bit, disregard the packet. This dire wolf, because six, seven, eight, nine uh, uh, decoders are running at the same time, if you get one or two that gets a fade and the other two hear it, it can still put it together. So that dire wolf TN, sound powered TNC, um, they're, they're much better performance than the hardware TNCs. And hardware TNCs are, water, are in these Kenwood radios. So then scroll down just a little farther. No, that is the bottom. Okay. There's, there's two UHF paths here. Oh. So, and we're talking about, so the first one is a 5 eighths wave with, you know, your 40 or 25 watt UHF radio. And I was conservative on that. And it's mounted on the car. So the height is two meters above ground, right? Scrolling down to this bottom one, take that same radio and you get a, an 11 dB gain, a beam antenna with you. And you get it out, of, you know, hook it to a pole and you're three meters above the ground and you're aiming that 11 dB gain antenna to one end to the other, the, the neighboring site, that's where that's a much stronger path. So scroll up so I can see both of them. Just, nope, there you go. So with the Omni antenna on the car, you receive uh, signal margin, but you're going to, you know, what, what you've got over the minimum is 26.7 dB with just an Omni antenna. But when you've got that beam antenna, you've got 45 dB more than you need to make a good path. So, and these, these charts, I made them for every site on the trail. And uh, this is so I, but you know, all right, let's go to the next one. Cause this one's a good path and it works well. Now, if we go from Klingman to Roan Mountain, right? Let's start at the first one at the top. Two meters, you see your Fresnel zone, you've got some encroachment but you'll see that you've got 27 dB more than you need to make it work, right? So it's plowing some dirt, so to speak. It's got some obstruction, but not so much that it kills a signal. And so this works at two meters, right? Then the one right below it, there's UHF. And you know, the, you still got the encroachment, but look at the two meters uh, received over, well, what did we say it was? Jeff, go up a little bit so I can see it. So you had 27 dB more on two meters than you needed. Well, on UHF, you've only got 6.9 dB more than you need. So you're starting to get towards a hairy edge, right? You're not gonna, uh, you're not gonna have a lot extra to work with. If you've only got 6.9 dB, can you imagine if you get to the hilltop, you've got crappy coax, two or three antenna adapters, BNC 259, a 90 degree adapter, all that stuff. If you're not getting all that power to the antenna because of adapters and coax, if you've got 6 dB and a lot more losses than we assumed, then you've only got 0.9 dB. You're right on the edge of the receiver threshold to be able to decode. So, you know, Jeff's going to talk about what do you bring into the site, test, 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 and all that. Now, if you bring that beam antenna and you've got a good piece of coax, no antenna, no line loss, and you know you aim that you're back up to 25 d 25.5 db more than you need that's where gain is your friend it hasn't changed the radio power or anything although i did go up no, that one is 35 watts instead of 25. all right and what is the power rating on uhf for those kenwoods is it 35 watts i think it's 35 yeah yeah at uhf okay all right next site actually i was going to interrupt um over yeah, in the chat, you can see a comment from Glenn that this accurately reflects the field conditions at Roan Mountain that he's seen for years. The UHF to Klingman's really bad. Yeah. So field proven. Well, and so yeah. one of the ways to improve that is to make sure you've got better quality coax. You know, even if you don't have a beam antenna, if you can take an Omni and get it up a little higher or a base station antenna that's got a little more gain than a 5 h wave or Make sure if you are using a mag mount, get it on the center of your roof of your car. But also, if you're not at the point that we're figuring the lat long, you're in a point that's lower or is blocked. It's, you know, the, the position that you're in with that GPS is critical to, to the success of this path. And, uh, yeah, this one's uh, 135 kilometers. Again, it's, they're, they're long shots. So we're getting, we're actually getting run to sponsor. 
uh, this year's event. So they'll be building a tower at uh, Rowan Mountain for you there, Glenn. It'll be all set. Huh. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Actually, I have a communications trailer and I've got a 35 foot crank up mass and everything like that. Why so. does that not surprise me? <laughs> it was a business write off with a, it's a nice toy. That's awesome. All right. Cool. So, and again, if you've got the gain antenna, and of course we're using a full 35 watts, you get 25 dB more on that same UHF path to make it happen. So, but again, if you're using crappy, you know, anybody that has a little Radio Shack RG58, it doesn't go anywhere near the spec that reg regular, like Belden RG58 cable is. And again, so we talked about the testing. If you can put a power meter on one end and then measure the power right out of the radio and then measure the power out on the other end of the coax, that's going to be a pretty good indicator of whether or not you're losing a lot. And remember, the loss in power also is the same loss back from that signal you're trying to receive. It goes both ways. It's not just about your power out. If you've got losses too, you've got losses on the signal you're trying to receive. That's that balanced path thing, you know? It goes both ways. And well, you know, if I got I got crappy coax, I'll just turn the power up. Yeah, but you're still losing it when the other half that you're trying to hear, your receive signal. So that's it, it, you know, it easily forget about you're losing that on the receive side too. Okay, uh, what are we at? Uh, you want to look at the next slide? We can go through it. All right, this is an interesting one. Let's just look at the paths for right now. You know, these. this one's, in, you know, uh, Roan to Comer's Mountain. Uh, that's a pretty good one. I mean, it's a little bit of a blockage, less so at UHF. All right, let's go to the next site. Oh, that one had a nice write-up. So if, if you start looking at this one, this one's, this is a real long link, right? 173 kilometers. You're starting to get some encroachment at two meters, right? You're into, you know, you're only four tenths of a Fresnel zone clearance, but I know, with enough power, you know, you're getting 33 dB signal. So you got enough to get there. Um, and the UHF on an Omni, it, it, because it's a higher frequency, the Fresnel zone clears up a little bit. You get your six tenths, so you're not getting lost because of that. And then scroll all the way down, Jeff. You know, and with a gain antenna, you know, clearly that's a good path. All right, next site. All right, this one, we're starting to get, we're plowing a little dirt again, right? You're not enough that it blocks the signal. You know, we, we, if everything's, all the stars align and you've done it based on what we've predicted. And again, this two meter path is based on 45 watts, not an HT with five watts, you know, I, I can't stress that enough that being on the hilltop, bring your HT. And if you've got a, you know, Kenwood HT, that's great. And you can, sometimes there's enough power to make it work, but also you're not transmitting as much. So you may be difficult to hear from somebody else on the other end. So uh, the HTs are not, you know, you don't get the DB gain with, you know, no, without putting 45 watts out. So that's, this is where you, where you can see that. All right, next, next site. All right, this is another one is pretty good. You know, Bob knew about all these sites and picked them out over the years where we we're trying to figure this out, you know? Next site. This one, you're looking at a little encroachment, but it, not horrible, especially UHF. And again, this UHF is figuring good coax, Good connectors, not a lot of adapters. The next site. Paris is our one of our ugly ones. There's a pair of hills right dead in the middle of this path. Now, you got enough power? Ask a question about that path. Say that again, John. May I ask a question about that path? Sure, go ahead. Well, it, the uh, Fresnel zones in, in particular. Most of them they saw show a single green line. This one's showing two green lines. I and I, you, yeah, I'll tell you what. And you, and you, yes, and you said you wanted to have uh, it unencumbered through 60% of the Fernell zone. 
so that anything that impinges on it should only impinge up to 40 percent and we're looking at a, a cross plane here that was looking at an azimuth up and down but you also measure that fresnel zone um uh looking down because in other words you might have uh a peak which is within the Fresnel zone, but not on the direct line between the right, two. Right. It could be left or right. That right. If you've got a really narrow uh, slot through the mountains or something like that, yes, that's a, that's a good question. Now, this one, what you're seeing with the two green lines, is actually the effects of knife edge diffraction. You can get signal over sharp hilltops, buildings, and stuff like that. It's called knife edge diffraction. It's got some pretty big losses, but it it like bends the signal because it hits a good sharp uh, obstruction and it can do it on the horizontal plane around the corner of a building and stuff. Not drastic, but this is a good case that you're using knife edge diffraction. So in the case of two meters in this path, your receive signal is only 19 dB more than the minimum. That's a lot less than what we've seen on these other ones. And if you look at the UHF with the Omni, You've only got 2 dB because of this knife edge diffraction. So everything has to be perfect to make that Omni work on UHF. And then scroll down, Jeff, a little bit to see the one with the beam. And you, you're picking it back up again because we're using 35 watts instead of 25. And you've got the 11 dB gain of the beam antenna. So this is where, this is one of those sites, and you guys have probably got the experience with this, that you might not be making paths and stuff. Uh, and at 9,600 baud, it's even more pronounced because you really need good signal. And on 9,600 baud, you know, I talked about the twist of polarization. That can happen with some of the 9,600 baud stuff as well. You could, you could, there are distance limitations on 9,600 baud paths because of uh, timing and twist and all that, because it's more critical when you're doing frequency shift keying instead of audio shift keying. So, uh, but this is definitely one of the ones. Now this is also factoring in that uh, you're right where we thought you were. If you find a different spot, different parking lot, you don't hike up that hill, it's the last 50 feet of elevation, you wanna operate from the car for whatever reason, you know, these paths don't show that. And so, and you know, Lynn's talked about that. This is where you're starting to see it. All right, uh, but the, and of course it goes both ways. You can flip flop the positions left and right, but the path is still the same between the two points. All right, so let's jump to the next site, Jeff. So this one, this is a pretty good one. You know, look at this, you know, we're back up to 25 dB, what we call margin, right? Cause you don't have that knife edge diffraction. You know, knife edge diffraction, you gotta have just power to plow through it. There's sometimes you've got too much obstruction and all the power in the world, can't, you can't plow dirt, so to speak. Um, you know, so this is a, a pretty reasonable path. All right, next one. What was, oh, yeah, you have a couple missing here. You were wanting to do this. So what's the next one? Oh, you're missing a bunch of them. That's right, you and I, I forgot to tell you about that. But uh, you know, right. the rest total slacker. Nah, we talked about it and then I saw it and I'm just paying jobs and stuff getting in the way. Um, but the rest of the sites are, you know, pretty good. But again, I can give the details if anybody wants them when they're going to these sites, we can give that text detail. What's your azimuth need to be both magnetic and true and all that to make sure that if you've got a directional antenna, you know, you're, uh, you're aimed in the right direction to try to get to whichever end you're, you're getting to. But again, the power budgets, the DB loss, the quality coax, the, you know, the antenna that's putting out what we think is the power. You know, it's good to just throw a watt meter on that and make sure that it is showing. You know, power that you, you could have weak finals and you work a local repeater all the time and you've never noticed the difference. You know, have, have every, uh, each of you actually tested your power output of your radio uh, yeah, it's it's something that's that's easy to not do because it always works, right? Let's see here, exit full screen. Let's see this one. Okay. Uh, 
Question on this. I'm the guy on Mount Washington, okay? Yep. Go to the Mount Washington path. Right there. Oh, well, e either one of these. Um, hey, this one gets had, So you had my effective radiated powers, 109 watts? Are you, yes. Let's see. So on, on, you start at two meters, you got 45 watt out of the radio. Got 3 dB of antenna gain. So 45 watts, you double it, right? So wait, um, that's, that's 3 dB over a dipole? Yes. I'm running a J-pole. It's not going to have 3 dB a di oh, gain over a dipole. All right, so the, there's, there's one issue that can make a path work or not work. I'm factoring in 1.3 dB of line loss. So yes, your EIRP without 3 dB gain is not going to be that good. Let, let's stick with this one for a quick sec. Sure, that's because fine. On, that's great. On, on, vo on voice, Tim is the one on Katahdin, and I'm on out Washington. And we know on voice, we can each take a biofang and talk to each other. Well, so go scroll back up to the two meter one. So the re re received relative is 17.2 dB more than needed. Now, remember, I'm factoring these at neg 113, which is probably 6 dB more than what your receiver sensitivity is going to be because it's for packet. So let's add six more dB to this that negates, you know, if you're doing them on boat fangs and stuff like that, yeah, you you might hear a little picket fence and my little fade. Uh, but oh, also each of these paths, I've got statistical losses of almost 10 dB. And what that means is that over a year's time, weather, water, moisture, all that stuff, you, a radio path, you build in what they call a fade margin. So how much can it fade before it doesn't work? So this one has got almost 10 dB fade or fade margin built in. So yeah, in perfect conditions, you can be almost 27 dB or uh, 23 on a J pole better than what we've predicted because you've got, you know, you've taken out all the fudge factor, all the, you know, uh, fade margins and such, and the extra signal that we're requiring for packet. So that's not surprising. John. Okay, can we go back up to the one where Mount Washington is again, the one above this? The mountain above this? Cathedon, or you want to talk to Equinox? No, no I want to see the one that has uh, Equinox to Mount Washington. Yeah. So we don't, I don't know what the, I don't, we do have, yeah, okay. Okay, so. Yeah, plenty of signal there, yeah. Okay, so once again, the fact that I'm not running a gain antenna is not, yeah, I'm trying to understand, does this look to, as a really <laughs> dumb question, does it look to me like what I'm doing is Mount Washington is okay, or should yeah. I be thinking about beefing up my station there? No, so, so, so the Equinox on two meters, you've got 37 dB more than you need, you've got plenty. You're only okay. losing 3 dB with your, so is, that would be 34 instead of 37. So you got 30 dB more than you, you, you know, you need. You're good. Okay, thanks, Brian. I was just trying to understand oh, how to, I really to, want to these, ask those these charts. So, you know, when I'm looking at a mountain, know whether I need to improve things or whether I'm good or, you know, what to do. Yeah, that's exactly the planning. This is why we're, we're teaching this because you can, to, you know, if you were the one that's got E6 dB or 9 dB, and I was factoring in 3 dB and you've got a J-pole, it's probably not going to work or it's going to be marginal. Go ahead, Don. Oh, yeah, Brian. Did you look at uh, Greylock to Equinox? Yeah, that's the next one back. Uh, is it on there? I didn't see um, it's it. Not, yeah, it's not. It's you not didn't have the image. Hang on. I might, might be ready to use now. Uh, almost. I'm almost done. I'll look at it in a minute as soon as my software gets Sure. Finished. Because one of the things is that uh, uh, Linda and I were chatting in the background, at least in my experience, where I normally put the Greylock location is not at the summit because mm -hmm. you need special permission for the summit. You've also got a big radio antenna. So we do it below the summit. And then there's been a discussion in the past of where we have to be that is not resolved as far as I know. You're in a parking lot below the monument. Is that what you're saying? Uh, we are, uh, I, I think uh, 
Lynn has actually moved the markers in APRS FI, but it's either a pullout where the main road going north across the ridge splits with the road that goes to the summit. That's the preferred location because that's safest. And the alternate is a lookout somewhere along the main road, which may be better to Equinox. We need to understand both spots. As soon as I'm done here, uh, loading the map data, I'll create a zoom in of where I've got the point over sure. aerial, right over an aerial image. And we'll, we'll, we'll nail um, this down right now. Jeff, if you yep, can pop open I'm, the APRSFI link. Yep, I'm working on it. Okay, figured you might be, but before we left the topic and went to a different one. There. Well, and you can see that right there in the center by Bascom Lodge is where we had the object. It moved down to the southwest to the pull off that Don's talking about. And then he's proposing an alternate one, which is northwest of where he used to operate or where we had the marker, which is just a road pull off, which is not as safe for him to operate there. So those are the two objects. The coordinates are over in the chat. But where we had Greylock is definitely not where he's been operating. Yeah, you can't operate there without special permission. It'll just be swamped by the uh, and the commercial antenna. He'll just die. And Jeff, if you uh, switch over to the terrain view at APRS.fi, you'll get an idea of how much he's dropping off the peak. It's up under map. Left upper left corner where it says map. Oh. Drop that down to terrain. And you can see we're dropping off pretty steep to come down to the safe one down there. We're not dropping off as steep if we go to the uh, to the northwest relocation. Where's the sure antenna where... done? Right, uh, the antenna is basically at the Veterans War Memorial Center, right next to it, if I remember right. Uh, right in the dead center, that little blue mark. Yeah. This is where the antenna that causes the interference is. Turns out the last two years, the uh, operator was operating at the peak up there. Got away with it, huh? Yeah. Well, that's good. But the last time you were there, Don, you were on that pullout on Notch Road, right? That's correct. That's the last time I did it. Yeah. The time we were most successful, we actually were in that little parking lot. That was actually where we were for the first connection. There it is. Ooh, yeah. yeah. That's a that's a big one. Yeah. No, you don't want to be near that. Okay. Important safety tip noted. Oh, and not so much safety, but desensing, right? That Don? too. <laughs> that just you know. You see that parking lot to the north of the, the war memorial up here? Yeah, that's where the operator was um, the last two years. Let me see the terrain here again. Let me see. Uh... All right, let me I'm share my screen. Jeff, why don't you, uh... oh, hang on, let me zoom in one more time. Let me get I'll be right back. Oh, yeah. All right. We got you now. Uh, let's see. Where am I? Share screen. Where is this one? And Brian, I want one. You want one what? Your software. It's free. It's years worth of learning. I I developed this with the with the author over years because I had sixty and seventy thousand dollars commercial software license at the same time. Radio Mobile is as good as any sixty seventy thousand dollars software if you know what you're doing. It's just it's a straight, steep learning curve. All right, now there's where we got it plotted. You see that? What are we looking at here? We just see the uh, overhead sap. Greylock. That's Greylock with the site plotted right there. Okay. Don, is that in the right spot? 
Well, that's on the summit. If you look uh, southwest, you'll see a little pullout where there's a road junction and then a little pullout. Southwest. Oh, yeah, down the hill. Yep. yep. Right there. And, and if you look uh, northwest, you can see where the lookout is. The road gets a little bit wider up there. Uh, right there? No, nope. oh, way, nope. way up to the northwest. Northwest. Way out, northwest. way out. Oh, up here? There, right there. you go. Which Those one? Are two obvious places. Oh, all right, let's, let's do this. Uh, I'm perfectly happy if we take the, let's examine this offline. And if, in fact, you and I could have a separate session so I can understand the trade offs here. That would be great. Okay. Yeah, and John, um, I just sent you coordinates over the chat. I think you and I should discuss um, where you could possibly park on Mount Washington to hit Katahdin and Greylock. I, I sent in the chat, I sent coordinates. That might be a good place. I, plot, I plotted that out in Google Maps. And that's, uh, as you see, there's two parking lots. There's that's the lower one. It's one right above it. Last year I was in the parking lot right above it. And generally, and some years I've been in the lower one, I usually tend to get more towards the middle of it than down on that far end. But yeah, right. I, I think the far end, I, I also sent you a text. Maybe if you want to get on 80 meters later, we can uh, chat about it too. So we're not on this call. Okay. Well, you know, we're, we're still good, doing good for time. Are these the only two sites we've got issues? Do you think about placement? Tim, just for reference, uh, John on Mount Washington talks to Equinox, not to Greylock. It should talk to both. <laughs> it's a lot easier to get to Equinox. Okay, sorry, my bad. Yeah, we normal, at least in my experience, we could hit Mount Washington, but it was inconsistent. We actually had to move from the summit towards the southeast to get to sure. Washington cleanly. So we want we want to look at that right now. I mean, I've got the time. No. Take long. I'd like to sit and, and do uh, Greylock to Equinox and Greylock to the, I think it's Sam's point below it, as a separate session, if you wouldn't mind, Brian. Okay, we'll do that. Do we want to look at Mount Washington again or what? Sure. Yeah, let's do a little live action radio mobiling here. Uh, let's see. So the first question, we're using the qu same coordinates as the ones Tim sent in chat. Uh, let me let me get the map zoomed out to where we need to be first. Then we'll talk about I can add coordinates and all that stuff. Oops. This draws a lot faster when I'm not doing the whole eastern seaboard of the United States. Jeff, do you see why I wanted to make sure you downloaded data first? I did not. This is just extracting from a hard drive, not from the internet. Oh, dude, my my downloads are flying. Yeah, they're pulling fiber in my neighborhood today. Finally, <laughs> I've got fiber now. It's definitely helpful. So there's Equinox. I got to zoom this out more to get Washington at the same time. You can see more detail in the terrain when you get more zoomed in. By the way, for any of you really map geeks, this terrain data is what they call 10 meter resolution. That means that I have hard and fast elevation points every 10 meters Ooh. to draw this 3D rendering and to do the path study. We a lot of a lot of data is only 30 meter resolution, which means they interpolate more and assume more. And when you've got drastic changes in terrain over short distances, that gets smoothed out. This is much more detail, which lets you see those obstructions that much better. Let me hope that I got far enough this time. No, geez. 
you guys are really taking that shot long. Well, let's look at Equinox first. So let's look at Mount Washington Equinox, right? Equinox, Mount Washington. Let's do this. Yeah, there we go. So now there, there's Mount Equinox to Mount Washington. And that's based on the data that we've got. Now, let me do a zoom in map. Where is it, Mount Washington? We want to look at where you're going to move. Is that what? Yes. Done. All right. So let me do this little trick. Create a zoom. Yes. So that's an ugly picture, but I can do this. Aerial. Is that close enough that we're going to know where we can put it? No. Can I go closer? Okay. How's that? Not really. Is that the top of the mountain? Yeah, in the dead center it is. Yep, there's, I think that is. Uh, Yeah, I, see the, the, I see the road to the north. Yeah, that's the road. That's the auto road. Yep. This is probably it right here, right? I'm, no. I'm still thinking the center of the map, but we'll see. That's what we think is the center. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I think that's correct. But where could do you want to be? Go right into the center. I can't just zoom, zoom in. I can't just zoom. This is not like a regular mapping. Program. Okay. It looks like just south, just barely south of the dead center is where the parking lot is. And yeah. you're going to drop, drop off probably what, 100 feet altitude in that slight move, John? Yeah. Have, if you, got, that. have you got coordinates? Yeah, they're in the chat. Uh, can't see the chat right now. I can read them off to you. Somebody, somebody tell me the coordinates. 44.2690. Or wait, are you in decimal degrees or what? No, I have 2690, yeah. Uh, 38707. And what? then uh, negative 71.30. Three three triple nine. Close enough for government work. Well, actually, this is pretty critical. So, hang on, I gotta turn something. Yeah, it's looking good. Stay in there. Okay. Now let's do this. I'm going to make it part of the proper network. You're going to be two meters above the ground with an antenna? Uh, um, yeah. About six feet? Yeah. Okay. Two meters would be 12. Uh, yes. It may be a little higher, nine feet. But. Let's do, we'll go to zero dB gain because you're using a J-pole, right? Right. Okay. And you say, it's, is it going to be nine feet or how tall is it going to be? You tell me. Well, when you ask the height, is that the center of the J-pole, the top of the J-pole, the bottom of the J-pole? The bottom is good. Um, six feet, sure. So we're already good at two meters. Okay. Oh, John, when you go to Nearfest in a couple of weeks, pick up a uh, a small gain uh, vertical at HRO. In the yeah, uh, maybe taller pole. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, something maybe even a 3 dB gain antenna, that'd be crazy good. 50 bucks for like a Comet antenna. Sure, I can do that. But these are the kind of questions, Brian. Am I better off with getting a higher antenna or a better antenna, right? Both. <laughs> right. Just throw money at it. That's all. That's it. With all that money you saved, John, in that HT, you know? Here you go, Tim. I'll be standing there talking to you on my biofang with a thousand dollar antenna. <laughs> I'm going to bring the four element uh, beam up with me this year, so just in case. That's the problem. All right, let's try that now. It's under pressure. Why? Well, there we go. I select the right one on the right part of the list. There we go. So at that spot to Mount Washington, that's a no brainer. 37 dB. 30, yeah, that's zero dB, one, 1 1.3 dB a line loss. So that spot's good to Equinox. Do we want to look at Catheter or what? I'm interested, but I don't want to hold everybody up, so. <laughs> Let's do Brian, what are the green, red, and yellow lines along the terrain that are shown in that picture? Uh, hang on, I'll show you. So, you know, the interesting thing when you're in the program, you know, you see where, where's that block, right? If I click there, it shows where it is on the map. These green and yellow lines are signal strength meters supposed to be. So on the actual map that follow the terrain, they're green and yellow and red. Uh... Yeah, that, so if you sat at that spot, you would be below. Well, some of it, oh, it's the clutter class too. Let me, let me show you something neat. It doesn't have as much of a factor here, but um if i create what they call a land cover map now the terrain is 10 meter resolution but my land cover or clutter data is uh only 30 meters well we, we look. so out of all that terrain there's all your trees your water your your cropland all that so when you go across that path and every piece of clutter that you're, well, let me do that, right? Yeah, you can't see the line, but like when I draw the line between here and here, all that stuff that's right on the top of the terrain is the clutter. And I can set the clutter, like I can set the tree heights and the density and such. Does that make sense? Got it. Uh, and it's, oh yeah, there it is right there. So like when, if I click right here on the map, right, it's green. It's also green forest right there. Can you see that crosshair below it? Yeah. And then the red is actually where you don't have enough signal. If, if you were to be at that spot, you would not have a signal. Because you're down behind this mountain, out of snow zone, you, wouldn't, you couldn't have a path back to Equinox. But the green is the, the tree clutter, the yellow, that's like, oh, you're marginally got signal there, right? You gotta get higher. 
to get the right signal. Brian. Yes. This, this software, suppose you were citing like a, a broadcast FM tower on Mount Washington. Does this show you, give you the ability to show you where the signal can be heard? Yeah, that's that's the propagation maps that Jeff kept telling everybody I was going to do tonight. And I said, no, I'm not. Because one of the things we, I want to do is I want to get a like a ham back in Maine who's not on the trail, who I know I can communicate with his QATH so he can relay messages for me. So yeah, I'd like to be able to know where people can hear me and where they can't. Yeah, you can do that. It takes a while to run a propagation map, depending on all the details and how big of an area. Or if you've got a particular place you'd like to talk to reliably, like your friend's house, I can just add that as another station and we can do a point to point path to see if it would work. That's much quicker than running the coverage yeah. map. But yes, you can do both. But if I took it at home and played with this, I mean, to do a propagation map, was it a couple of hours or something? It depends on how big of an area, but. Yeah, it's going to take you a couple of months to get to the point to run a propagation map. There's the radio mobile online version. It's much right. easier to use because it, okay. it, it only does ham stuff. I use this for the commercial stuff all day long. I do microwave, you know, 2.45 gigahertz stuff. It's that good. Um, but uh, I want to look at Catherine, by the way. And did you say the Windows version is free or not? Yes. There is only a Windows version. It's yep. only you said the Windows online. are online. That's it. Oh, and the online. You can run it successfully on the line, though. But so if we were going to do a bunch, you'd recommend download the Windows version and install it. Yeah. Just so you know, my computer, I've got an eight core, 16 thread. Uh, of course, this only uses one core. This is older code, so it won't use more than one. And my GIS software uses all 16 threads. I've also got a 1660 Ti NVIDIA CUDA card with 1500 GPUs that my GIS software uses all those in parallel too. So I'm running like a cray when I'm doing my GIS stuff. Yeah, and GIS I'm, is heavy lifting. But Radio Mobile still only runs on one core. But I've got 64 gig of RAM, uh, one terabyte. Uh, solid state drive with the operating system running on that and another 11 terabytes across four other hard drives. Now I noticed that there's an online version as well as the locally run version comments on the yeah. two. Yeah, so the online version is should be a lot less. You, you know, it's only used for ham frequencies and it's probably a lot less tweakable. Got it. So okay. Every, every, I've had to use other pieces of RF software and I hated it every time because it would, even with some of my experience, it would take me a good month to even get you know, proficient with the software because every software author does it different. And you know, while I know the theory, while I know the data and all that stuff, it's just their software does it different. All right, Mount Washington Catholic. Let's do the right one. Oh, that's because that's the wrong one. Oh no, that's from yeah, from that point. Ooh. So that spot to Catherine. We don't like that path. Do you struggle with that? So I'm 8.6 dB below the threshold. I've got <laughs> um, yeah. a margin here. I moved to the other end of that path, that parking lot. I get a better path to Tim. Yeah. Well, let's move that. Give me those coordinates. Oh, let me see if I can get you some. Yeah, see, this is, why, this is part of one of the things why we talk about this. I'll get you ready for coordinates. Yep. 44 decimal 270414. 70414. Correct. Okay. Minus 071 decimal 301587. 
And that's probably much better to be positive. <laughs> John, can you still get Equinox when you if you move to this other site? Yeah, this Equinox other will not be as good. That's my issue. And that long parking lot, the line between these two, there would be the optimal place in there to get both. It's a trade-off. And, and the other thing, Tim, I assume the coordinates he's using for you so on look at that. The look at that. There's your two. There's your there's the site you just gave me, right? Right. That one you gave me before doesn't have a path. You're right. That's why you got to move. Hope everybody sees that. Well, with the new location, you still have the other side, the other end? That's the question. Can I get an Equinox from this location? I got to zoom the map, map back out to do that. So the three location gets you, and you're not, let's see, it. and then UHF. You're not, you, you can make it, but all right. So now I got to zoom back out. Let's do this. Let's do this. First position. Let's see what this gets us where we got to be. Jeff, I'm burning up your time. I've given up. So I wanted to go first. I knew I was going to do this because this was a lot of burning questions, right? So while that's computing, Brian, those two coordinates are maybe 200 yards I can't, apart. While the map's drawing, I can't. I'm stuck. I got to wait. Let's okay. Notice. But those two coordinates are maybe 200 yards apart, right? And One is working to Cantad and the other isn't. So the optimization I have problem I have, assuming I could be any wire along that 200 yard line, where should I be to get best coverage to both? I don't know that definitively without checking. Right, but you you understand the problem I'm trying to yes, solve. Absolutely, just yeah. go to the top, sit up in the snow. But this same situation can happen if anybody moves around on any of these hilltops. Right. The same type of scenario can happen. All right, now hopefully I've got enough there. Yes, just enough. All right, so path. That's about to work. You got equinox to this this spot. Pick that spot and stay there, John. I've worked at, I've worked from that spot in past years, but sometimes we've had problems. So I that may be because Equinox was not in the same spot every year. Well, if, yeah, if Equinox is in a different spot than I've got for data, I can't vouch for that. No, well, let me just no, I guess it won't be able right. But the thing I'm taking the kind of the takeaway I have here, Brian, is you even move a hundred yards and it can have, make a major difference. Yes, that's why that's why I wanted to do this present presentation today. So while this site to Equinox, either one works, right? Yep. But if we go over this one to Cath yeah, Katahdin, the first one you gave me doesn't work. Right. But the second one you gave me does. Well, hmm. Oh, it's different now because I'm zoomed out further. I lose my resolution and terrain data. But 
Now, Tim, are you always at the identical location on Katahdin every year? Pretty much, yeah. Because you're not right on the summer, right? You're off the summit just a little bit. Uh, pretty much on the summit. Okay. I would say I'm like no more than 30 feet from the summit. The only reason is there's a million people up there. So I just okay. try to get away from them. But I think what I'm going to do is look at uh, my optimal position too, John. I'm going to bring the beam this year. I have to hold it in my hand. So uh, we'll figure out how I'm going to do it all. But um, we've never I, really needed it. I know we haven't, but if it's going to help you get Equinox, then the additional gain that I'll have from this thing, I mean, it only weighs a pound or two pounds. I mean, but I yeah, got to pick and choose what I'm doing. Hiking a big mountain, every pound counts. And every pound counts, right? Well, I mean, I got to pick and choose too because are we? Am I bringing the the Dyna and the FT817 and all that stuff too? So I got to figure out what we're gonna do. That's all. What do you use them for a radio, Tim? Uh, just a Kenwood TH uh, D72. So you're only on an HT. Yep. Hang on. Let's uh -oh. touch. Uh oh, here we go. Dropping the wattage, uh -oh. dropping the antenna efficiency. <laughs> hey, I got a five eighths wave telescoping vertical, though. Yeah, so, whatever you do, uh, Tim, don't take that walkie talkie and hold it at a 45 degree angle. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm 5,400 feet up, so <laughs> this is the I longest gotta... path. This, this is the longest path. Right now, this path is 161.9 miles. We make it every single year, except for last year. We we made it over voice, but not actually. We made it over twelve hundred baud. Right. So on the HT, now, well, yeah, you're putting forty five watts out on two meters on the Mount Washington side, but you're down to. Uh, yeah. See. So look at this. This is going from Washington at 45 watts to Katahdin. Now, if I swap this to where I'm looking at your transmit side, Tim, it says we don't make it, or we just barely make it. Now, that's adding, there's 5.7 dB fade margin. Remember, this is strong enough signal to do hack, not for voice. Your voice you can put up with a lot. The negative 113.3 is a sensitivity. Your voice, you're, you're going to be down, to, you're going to have six more dB to work with. So you're you're right on the hairy edge with an HT. Yeah, I'm going to bring the, the I have a four element uh, Yagi that I can assemble at the top. That'll make a difference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've used it a couple of years, uh, but then we figured out we didn't need it. Uh, I don't know what the other station, uh, there was another station before John, somehow that we, maybe they had a different antenna set up, but <clears throat> they didn't need it from me. And then uh, John and I, a couple of years ago, did it no problem. And last year we had trouble. So John, you definitely would want to get the three, the extra three DB. So it'll make your power a lot more. Sure. What's what the point I'm making you'll have an extra 3 dB of his signal that's already weak that you're getting on receive gain. So while you don't need the transmit power, you need it for additional receive of his weak signal. Gotcha. Would height make any difference to me? 3 dB is double. No, height. Yeah, I understand that. I no. was asking a separate question. I don't really need any more than two meters of height, right? No, you're not, the height is not the free space loss is because this is such 160 mile path, right? Mm. You're just running out of power from a five watt HT, you know, just over distance. That's the laws of physics. Right. So this- John, this I'm gonna send you a couple of pictures of a drive. I think you have, do you have a drive on mast adapter? Who, me? Yeah. I don't think Tim, that's gonna make as much difference as him putting three dB gain on his antenna for receive. Because right now I'm factoring him at zero, zero dB, right? Um, if he gets three, if I get three more dB receive on him, it takes you from a minimum of two point seven dB to five point seven dB. It doubles, okay. you know. That's the difference. 
that's why I'm talking about those imbalanced paths because this is a, this is an imbalanced path because you've only got five watts on your end. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear him fine, right? Watch, I'll swap his back. You know, you're going to have him with what, you know, 10 dB or more signal than you need to receive him. But when you're transmitting back, you're right, right at the threshold for enough pack or you know, enough signal to do packet, especially the 96. <laughs> that explains it because I heard John fine last year. He couldn't hear me. And we were both wondering what, what did we do to our radios? And and we can prove this, Brian. If you just put John on an extra 30 feet for his antenna in the air, hey, I don't I, think it'll make any difference to I how much signal he receives from Tim. How, what, so right now we're at two meters, right? Right. Right. So make it I 10 meters, 30 feet in the air. 2.5 doesn't make any difference. Right. I'll make it some absurdly high number. And it's just not going to make a difference, right? Yeah, put him on a 30-foot tower, a 10-meter tower. 2.8 dB. It's a point. It's yeah, not, no difference. It's the free space loss starting with only 5 watts. So the beam on your end, Tim, and the extra 3 dB, he's getting, you know, how many? How much gain do you think that 3 element is? 6 dB? Or it might be. Uh, mine, I don't know. It's 4 element, so it's probably... Probably the 10 or 11. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, we'll just say 10. I mean. Yep. So that'll get you 12.7 plus the 3 dB John gets on his end with a 3 dB gain antenna. It's 15 dB over. Yeah, you've got, that's that's the difference right there. Now, uh, can you show both the path to Katahdin and my path south to Equinox at the same time here? Uh, I'd have to go zoom back. Oh, wait a minute. No, that, that's okay. Well, I was curious. Yes, I were up. There, there they are right there. So they're okay. pretty close to 180 degrees apart, right? Just about. I can tell you exactly what they are. Hang on. Well, that's okay. My oh, question I've got is, the details here. Hold on. Details. I'm going to copy this and put it in uh, edit. Copy. Let's see if I can put that in the chat. Where am I? Where's chat? Chat's right there. So there's, that's the Katahdin to Mount Washington. That's the five watts going to Mount Washington. That's the written details. And the azimuth, magnetic and true are right there, okay? Now if I go Equinox, which way do you want it? Equinox first or Mount I Washington? I don't care. My question is relative to the end. Uh, I'll do them this way, right? Mount Washington to Equinox. So this is the same viewpoint. Yep. Edit, copy. There you go. You got the technical details, but your azimuth from Mount Washington to Equinox is 230 or 245 on magnetic north. And then, uh, then your your beam heading to Katahdin is going to be fifty eight or fifty nine point four seven degrees. Yeah, so it's pretty close to one hundred and eighty degrees apart. Yep, it's real close. So it's, instead of a three uh, dB gain. Uh, antenna which had an azimuth plot that looked like a circle. I really want an antenna whose azimuth plot looks like a figure eight, right? And get the two lobes pointing yeah, the out. Only, the only way you get those figure eights is like a, a, D, a station master or DB224 four bay, don't fold a dipole base station antenna. You don't want to take that up the hill with you. Okay. Um, but well, yeah. Maybe he does. He's a, two beams. He's a drive but, up, remember. Yeah, I'm yeah, trying to do this with my hands. And I got a van. <laughs> yes. John, I just sent you a text of a, a drive up mast adapter that I made at Home Depot for 20 bucks. Oh, the, when you drive on, you put a pipe in yeah. it? And yeah. And you can put a little painter's pole there and put a, a, yeah. a vertical antenna on it, no problem. Right. All right. So here's an omni antenna plot, right? Right. See that? Now, 
Let's see if I, I think I've got a DB240. This is the joys of doing this. Look at all the antenna patterns I've got loaded, and I don't have anywhere near enough. You could put like two three element beams back to back or whatever. That might give them a figure yeah. eight pattern. You know, no, that would work. It's just you got to have, you can do that, but you get a coax splitter. The, yep. two, the two jumpers from the beam to the splitter have to be exactly the same length. You lose 3 dB, right. but you're picking it up in the gain of the antennas. So like if it's a 10 dB antenna and you lose 3 dB, you're still going to have 7 dB gain. Yeah, Bob's website has a, uh, a diagram of that. Well, the, the one thing that struck me, Brian, is if I use two quarter wave verticals, I could get a cardinoid pattern real easy. Yeah, you could you could do that too. Yep. Again, the same thing is still going to happen, though. You're going to get 3 dB loss when you split antennas. So you might as well do it with two beams if you can get them, you know, and just get the extra gain. Yeah. Yeah, I can't find. I'd have to know the model antenna of the public. Well, let's sure, just. That's fine. Well, look at this. I mean, so if I go to a Yagi, you know, and what did we say that azimuth was? 56 or 8? So there's what your pattern yeah. would be to Katahdin, right, if you got a Yagi. And what was the azimuth I gave you for Equinox? 240-something. Uh, 230. There's what the pattern looks like there. I just need a beam of a front to back ratio of one to one. Yeah. <laughs> That's an omni. Well, no, squeeze in the sides, yeah. But these are good questions. This is exactly what I was hoping to help you guys with. With the, and now you can see about being up there. You're the only one along the trail that has an HT, right? Everybody else has got mobiles. Tim. Yeah, probably. All right, because I think you're the only one that's hiking, right? Lynn, do you know of anybody else that has, tries to do it with HT? Uh, not that it has to do it with an HT, but there are some nowhere near as tough as Tim's site, but like GD Hill, I've got a carded up, I don't know what the vertical climb is, 150, 200 feet vertical, and then at the top, they have to rope it up a tower. Oh, um, wow, that's fun. To get their height, and GD Hill was at one end of one of the critical links that you had found earlier, Brian. Right. So they have to go to the top of that tower. <laughs> because it was an obstruction link, oh, an obstruction what? issue, not a Hang distance on. issue. So it was GD Hill and what else did we have? I think it was I GD Hill to the north. We I want to let's, let's look at that one because I don't have that extra height factor then. I'm factoring everybody at six feet above ground. And I don't know exactly how tall the tower is, other than it's been described as like six or eight flights of steps. So zigzagging back and forth up the tower. Six or six or eight stories, so it's ten feet up. That's sixty feet. Uh, Lynn, do you know if it's a fire tower? Um, I believe it's a, an observation tower of some kind. I don't know if it's specifically yeah, saw, a fire I tower. Yeah, I on the website. Yeah. It's probably less than six stories then if it's six flights. They probably that's zigzag right. twice for each flight. Uh, that's yeah. a possibility. So let's 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 go 40 feet. That's much more than six feet. Hang on, I'm waiting my map to redraw here. And I'm pretty sure it was obstructions that was his issue, not distance. Well, we're doing night fridge to fraction. GD Hill to Camelback, or was that the problem one? It was one of those two. I think it was Camelback. Um, Jeff, if you still have the site you were looking at earlier, it showed it there. Which word are we looking for? Sorry. Oh, never mind. This looks like it. Yep. Yeah, so there's two peaks in the middle that give us the grief. All right, so let me go adjust the height of GD Hill. <laughs> GD Hill X1, right? So instead of two meters, I get in the right one here. 
Instead of two meters above ground, we're going to say 40 feet, right? That's about seven meters. I got a conversion tool. 12.192. No, no, it'd be. Uh, how many meters did you say? 12.192. Oh, yeah, yeah I did it backwards. Yeah, I can put feet and it'll convert to meters. Just looking at the picture, it doesn't look as bad. No, I let me do. Let me change the other UHF ones too. Oops. So UHF high power, it's got signal. It's but those mountains. Here, I can show you another trick. So we never know where we are when we're just doing the grayscale, but I can do this little trick. Helps us, right? So now I'm back there looking at this link, right? So we're wondering what's blocking that? Well, there's a hill right there, there's a hill right there. So it's actually those folds in the Appalachian Mountains, the folds, you see them? Yep. That's one where, you know, if we found a site that was farther east from GD Hill, we probably, well, maybe not, because you still got the ridge no matter what. Huh. And his link to the south is not a whole lot better, if I remember right. Oh, the set like the south was no problem, as I recall. Gamble, right? Well, then, wait a minute. It, it's not a whole lot better. Why, is, why did that one not show up on my list? because they're going to do it this way. There we go. That's better. Now, there's, it's, it's plowing a little dirt, but, you know, the UHF is sketchy, but yeah. As I recall, um, They've said that they have trouble making voice contact from GD Hill to Camelback. I mean, to is that Maryland Mountains down there? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Gambrel Hill. Yeah. So, yeah, they got to bring their A game. They got to get all the power that we're predicting for, right? Mm -hmm. What are they taking up there for radio? Well, it was a D710, I know. Uh, and, what antenna they were taking up, I don't know. And what's the condition of the jumpers you're using, right? What jumpers, what connector? Yeah. So and, they're going. And I'm not sure that every year they're taking the radio up the tower or if some years they were dropping coax down the tower and operating from the uh, ground. See, there's a problem, right? Don't know for sure. But and if they were doing that, then clearly you're going to have the only, if you've got 50 feet of Stuff it doesn't want to work at UHF, right? Yep. Have we helped tonight? Because I've really killed Jeff's schedule and we're almost on two hours. Absolutely. I've learned a lot. Thank you. No, this is great. Yeah, Thank and you. you're gonna you're gonna go offline and help uh, Don work out his issues. Yeah, we gotta do that one, right, Don? Is Don even here? He looks like he left. Yeah, so. he, he's here. He's just muted. We absolutely will. I just had to hit the mute button. Absolutely will. I'll send you a, a note asking what your free days are. I've done some work with the online one already, uh, getting some scoping, and uh, but I don't really know how to use the tool. If you, if you want to do it tonight, 
we can do it after we hang up. Uh, a little late for me. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Evenings tend to be tough for me because I go to my girlfriend's most times. She's pissed because I didn't go to her house tonight. <laughs> Uh-huh. But uh yeah, so uh honestly, everybody thinks this is worth the effort. Uh, Brian, just just speak to it. You don't have to show it. But uh so like Tim hypes up to Katahdin. Uh, you know, if you're doing summits on the air, you have to be within so many feet of the summit. But for what we're doing, you don't care if you're 100, 200 yards off or whatever. If you're trying to find the optimal place within a certain radius of the summit. Does this software let you do that in some easy way? Not an easy way, but you can. So, so what are you trying to find out? Because you can. Well, for instance, at Mount Washington, we discovered one end of the parking lot worked, one end didn't. Okay. So there's like three levels of parking lots. There's different places I could go to. So my, the real question is, what's the best place for me to be on that mountain of the, of the places I can go to? Well, it depends. You've got to have, they've got a thing, what they call find best sites. Okay. But, but you've got to know the sites that you want to talk to. Otherwise, if you want to know just what are the potentials, you would. Well, I know I've got to talk to Equinox and, and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, so let's, let's, what they call let's, let's just assume I was trying to optimize against Katahdin. So uh, you do what they call a find best site. So I would add Equinox. I would add uh, Katahdin. And right. I can do uh, what they call a reverse propagation map. Instead of coloring the map by colors or by signal strength, it colors it for percentage of the sites you're trying to reach. So the, anywhere the map says 100%, that means any spot on that map that has that color, you can talk to both sites with the given parameters. The problem okay. is, is that, you know, when you've got the imbalanced path of like Tim with the five watt HT, that gets to be a lot more challenging because uh, you, it can be done, but. Well, let's, let's break it down to a simpler problem. Let's assume Tim is the fixed station and we know his parameters on Katahdin. And I asked the question, where on Mount Washington can I best hear him? Yeah, you still do that reverse propagation because, uh, and then based on the map, it says you can hit both of them. You then look at that map and you say, okay, well, where can I actually okay. use so it? So if I do a reverse propagation map showing me, that will show me Tim's signal strengths at different coordinates. You're not on signal strengths. You're just seeing it colored where it would say like, if red is 100%, that means from that spot on the map, you can talk to both Equinox and Cathod. Well, leave Equinox out of it for a minute. You know, in other words, let's let's say Tim was an FM broadcast station on well, the top of Cathod. I would you, do a propagation map from Cathod. Right. Parameters, so it's five watts with a gain. Right, it right. It would be an omni plot, but, right. but, you know, assuming he's got the beam, then you could see, does that signal hit anywhere on Mount Washington and what signal strengths? And then you could use any of those points, yes. And what resolution does it give me? Well, it's not great resolution because that's- 10 meters? Well, it's, see, the problem is when you draw a map, the more you make the map cover ge geography wise, right. you, you're losing resolution because, and because sure. that's such a long path, I could do it, do it kitty corner. It's what we suppose we said, I'm gonna, I wanna get my propagation within a uh, rectangle that's uh, half a mile on the side. Well, you're not gonna have you know, half miles because you're not gonna propagate to Mount Washington. Remember, you gotta show both sites in the map. Oh, okay. So I can't, I got you. Now the propagation map path. is gonna whole, include the whole thing, not just- Or at least those two points. It gotcha. doesn't have to be big enough to be an Omni for Katahdin, but Katahdin's right. going to be in one corner and Mount Washington in the other. I got you. I, now I understand. Good Thank question, you. though. Very good question. Well, when you're citing broadcast towers, aren't you asking this kind of stuff? Yeah, I don't do broadcast stuff that much. I'm doing cellular, doing PCS, doing uh, 
wireless ISPs. So because of the microwave frequencies and everything, they're, they're usually not huge maps. You know, 10, 15 mile radius is typically the max. Right. But, but you're asking that question, you're putting a cell phone tower up next to a town and you're asking, am I gonna get good cell phone coverage in all the blocks of the town, right? Oh, yeah, or, or I'm looking at existing coverage and I'm trying to fill the gap. Yeah, I do that all day long, yeah. Gotcha, thank you. Well, that's a great question. What else has anybody got for questions? These are great. Len, did I pass the litmus test? 100%. <laughs> Brian and I talked earlier today about what the successful presentation is. And my, my litmus test was, if I've got one or two pertinent questions about what I presented, that means I presented good stuff. And man, hands down. Awesomely done, Brian. Hey, Jeff, I don't need to teach you how to use radio mobile now, right? You picked it all up? Bro. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of moving parts to doing a propagation. Tim, you look like you almost have a question. <laughs> Brian, this is. No, but I know where to aim my beam now. Well, after, I don't know, 12 years of going up there or 10 years, whatever it's been, I finally looked at Google Maps and looked at Mount Washington and where it was. So, you know what? So here's a great idea. Take the Google Maps. You can draw a path from Mount Washington to Katahdin, right? You just draw a straight line and look at the aerial imaging, get a ground reference for where that bearing is. But also with that path drawn on there, you can right click on the line and say show path, show, show path or show elevation. And it'll actually do a map similar to these. It doesn't take in the RF perimeters, but it'll do the cross section of the terrain. And it'll let you know if you've got a big boulder of a mountain in the way. You can do that anywhere on Google Earth. Draw a straight line. And then on the line in the places, just go show elevation. And it pops a window up below the map of the cross section, very similar to these just doesn't have an IRF. You can't adjust the heights on either end, but it's a great quick look at something. That's what, good it's designed, to know, what it's designed for is if you draw a hiking path, then you do that and you go, no, I'm not going that way because I'm hiking vertical, you know, vertical mountain versus if I take a different path, it's a much more gradual. So. Tim, you can see Mount Washington on a clear day from Katahdin, can't you? I don't think so. That's kind of far. It's 160 and, miles away. <laughs> yeah, most, most most visuals, you, like when I have to do view shed maps, because I do maps where you, if I put a tower on a hilltop, it, tell me where it can be seen. You know, I've had to do that for zoning hearings and stuff. They always cut those off at five miles because you figure your practical viewing distance by the naked eye is not much more than five miles. I mean, yeah, when you get up on the high sites, you can. But. Well, Br Brian, I can tell you, Mount Washington's tall. If you go to Bath, Maine, you can see Mount Washington from Bath, and that's pretty far. Yeah, it's one of the exceptions to the rule, but yeah. you, you do run into the, uh, without optics assistance, you're going to run into some challenges of uh, just what you can view, mostly because of the curvature of the earth and the distortion through the atmosphere. Is that, you know, if I remember right, Tim, when I was on Sugarloaf, I could easily see Katahdin on a clear day. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look back through I mean, my pictures a, and see what I could see. Path. You know what yeah. you do? What you do? Take a, a either a mirror or a laser or something like that and flash it when you guys are up there and see if you can detect it. I'm going to send you slow scan TV this year, John. <laughs> I got to get something to receive it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we could do that. Be cool. Hey, if you build a DigiPie, you can do that. Yeah, we're both going to have DigiPies. Yeah, we'll have it. Anybody? All right, guys, let's call it two hours. Yep. Good Thank one. you so much, Brian. Brian. Thank you. Excellent. I'm glad you guys liked it. I, I loved it. Off, but I can Excellent. Last people's eyes over real quick. Ron, you look <laughs> like you almost fell asleep. No. <laughs> No, there's, I'm there's paying only attention. one thing you didn't cover, Brian. What's that? Well, if you if one of my stations is a ship at sea and it's rolling in the waves. 
it, it, the, the, sometimes it makes a difference, sometimes it doesn't. If it's HF. Yeah, being a Navy HF. chief, I figured you could handle that. Actually, you can, because uh, I one of the jobs I had when I was a young buck in the Navy was uh, I was an interior communications electrician. I maintained the, G, uh, the uh, gyroscope on the ship. And the gyroscope sure. was three gimbals, and it always kept the azimuth and the artificial horizon. And that input went to the gun mounts and everything like that, because when the ship's pitching and you're trying to put a gun on target, you've yep. got a hydraulic motors to compensate for the pitch and roll of the ship. Also on the flight deck, we have a helicopter flight deck and we had a glide slope indicator to give the pilot an artificial horizon. And that was mounted on the ship's gyroscope input. And it would the ship would pitch and roll and you'd watch that thing stay flat and level no matter how much the ship was moving. So yes, I actually had a lot of work for that. That was fun stuff. And Thank it's, you it's so much. different from an airport glide slope because you got red over green or whatever it is. And there's actually a yellow because you can be below the, the artificial horizon and then you're really hurting if you're gonna come in for a landing. Yeah. See why I wanted to go first, Jeff? You done yet? I, I can keep going another two hours if you let me. But yes, I'm done. Cool. Unless, unless anybody else wants to know something. This was really great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. I'm Thanks. glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad, I hope everybody else enjoyed it too. I mean, good stuff. Well, hey, Brian, I don't think I don't think I came aboard any of the ships uh, that you may have been working on, but uh, I was in the Marines and I flew helicopters and uh, came aboard many of ships in the Navy. Oh, you flew? So you, yeah. you the glide slope indicator. Though. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, we did all the Anf the L-class ships, you know, the. Uh, I was on an LST, the one more county. So, I, I actually, okay, I, I actually may have landed on that one. There was one on, it was that East Coast? East Coast, and it was one they ran aground down off the coast of Chile and had to sink it right there. Yeah, I did. Um, I landed on an LST in 90, I think 90, 91. Okay. 95, then, I was on it for Operation Purple Star off uh, off the coast of Camp Wazoom when we did that D-Day uh, type uh, AMFEB operation. Okay. I did three med deployments and one from Okinawa. So from uh, 90, 91 through uh, 99. And then... Oh. I spent the, my last time up at the Pentagon and I did my 20 years and got out from there and still staying in that five-sided puzzle palace. <laughs> there you go. I'm, uh, I was 21, but mine was all reserve time. So I, I would go two weeks every year to go, oh yeah, this is why I don't do this full time. <laughs> <laughs> I can put up with anybody's crap for two weeks, but. Yeah, it's a little different when you're on there six months. Yes. Greg, I, I appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation. I really hope. And I'm seeing that John checked in here. I hope he enjoyed it too. John, I think that the uh, the direwolf stations, because of problems you have with long paths like this at 9600, I expect it to to perform amazingly. So uh, I I hope we get hard data to, to prove your point. I'm I'm impressed with it the way I run it at home now and on Digipy. All right, you all been sure. All right, guys, up? take care. <laughs> have a good night. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Take care, all. Have a good one. Right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.